Now we notice that the worth of money is largely affected by the economic conditions faced by a country, especially when in the times of invasion, economy collapses, the worth of goods immediately uh, spears up, and the worth of money diminishes. You know, in the ancient world, the worth of a god is measured by the power he exercises to protect a nation. When a nation is defeated by another nation, it is believed that this nation's god has been defeated by the god of another nation. And we know that in the time of exile, the nation of Judah was defeated by Babylon. You see, for the eyes of the other nation and for the eyes of Babylon back then, it is equivalent in saying that Yahweh is defeated, that Yahweh has lost his worth, that Yahweh is, no, is of no value. And here in the book of Daniel, repeatedly we are seeing that God is proclaiming himself through his people, through the remnant, through the, through, through the faithful few who still holds on to God in faith. And in Daniel, we saw that God is determined to show to the world that whatever happens to His people, He alone deserves worship and no one else. Now we read here in Daniel in chapter 3, how this faithful remnant of God, how the situation that they have faced came from bad to worse. Brother Joseph has read from uh, verse 1 to verse 18, but uh, let us re refresh ourselves by reading from verse 8. It says here, Therefore at the time certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews, they declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom have whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, then you, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who is able to deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now imagine these Jews. They came from the land of Judah. Back then, they even saw the temple. Probably they even saw worship in the temple. But even in their situation, many of their countrymen and some of their kings worship idols together with the worship of God. And God has to punish that nation. And in punishment, this nation was placed into exile. Daniel and his friends were the first few who went into exile. And from that nation of Judah, where there is wickedness, now they are in the nation 
that is much more wicked than Judah. And now the situation has worsened. They have to bow down to this golden image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. In chapter 2, if you would look at that for a moment, we see that Nebuchadnezzar himself fell down at Daniel when Daniel interpreted his dream. This does not mean to say that Nebuchadnezzar regarded God as the only God. Remember that he is a polytheist, so he has no problem in adding to his collection another God. So for him, the God of Daniel is another God. And in chapter 3, he built an idol for himself. And here we see that in chapter 3, we will see that Yahweh demands worship only for himself. Now notice this. Man, whoever he is, wherever they are, whenever they live, has that desire in his heart for worship. There is no man in this world who do not desire worship. And we ask, why so? Why is it that? Because God has created man as a worker, worshiper. As a worker, God's image become visible in man because God himself is a working God. God is the one who worked in creation. God is the one who is working in redemption, the new creation. And if we work, we are, we are living that image of God which is in us. Man being a worshiper, it's showing to us that God's image, as God's image, we are unique to all of the creation of God. It is, be, it is because that we are the only created beings of God that can commune with God, that can fellowship with God. In worship, man rises above creation and relate to God the Creator. And that is the glory of worship. We are rising above creation and we are reaching out to God. And we know that God has safeguarded worship when He gave it in His commandment. God commanded worship for Him alone. And you see, when many read the Ten Commandments, they are, th they are thinking that this is demeaning. This is irrational for man. Why does God command worship for Him alone? Well, we know that first and foremost, God is a jealous God. God is jealous for His own glory. But that is not the only reason. God commanded worship for Him alone. It is, it is also because God wants to preserve the dignity of man. When man worships God, it shows to us that God, that we being created in the image of God, we, can, we are the ones who can only worship God, our creation, our creator in, God, in that manner. But because of sin, the image of God was now marred and man is finding other things to worship. If man will not worship God, he will seek something else to worship lesser than God. In fact, even lesser than man himself. He will worship everything that God has created. He will worship idols that comes out from his mind. He will worship his intelligence and sometimes even his wickedness and his sin and here we see that to worship something apart from god is not only madness it is self-degrading when god created man to worship god it is degrading for man to worship any other thing apart from god And so we see here that the highest and the most noble activity that man can ever engage with is the worship of the true and living God. God is determined to convict the world of this fact that He alone is worthy of honor, praise, glory, no one else and nothing else. And here we would see 
that in the end, there are only two types of worship that man can render. One is by deception, and the other is by divine institution. We will see here first, the deception of human imagination. And secondly, worship institution from divine revelation. Firstly, we will see worship as the deception of human imagination. Here we would see the great king Nebuchadnezzar commanding all people from the, every part of his realm to worship the golden image that he has built. Well, Daniel did not record the time as to when was this, but the Septuagint dated it in the 11th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. You know, if that is so, then this was also the year when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. And Nebuchadnezzar set up this golden image. This practice of setting up a golden image once you have conquered vast lands or other nations, this is actually common, commonly done by the Assyrian kings. This is actually them proclaiming that they have the divine right and absolute right to rule. And this divine right is given by the gods themselves. When we try to examine this image, it is said that it is six cubits in width and 60 cubits in height. To put that in a measurement that we know, it's about nine feet wide, probably as wide as this platform, and 90 feet high. So, mataas, no? But I don't think that that's, that, that is fully an image of a person. Probably there's a very high pedestal and then uh, an image on top. Probably it's a, a monument. And in verse 4, we would find that Nebuchadnezzar issued a decree that everyone should bow down once they hear the sound of music coming from many different uh, instruments. It is the Nebuchadnezzar showing his supremacy over all men. It is Nebuchadnezzar showing supremacy over all the gods, the gods of these nations which he has conquered and defeated. It is showing supremacy even the God of Judah, Yahweh himself. And here this activity is very grand and it's a show of pomp. It's a showcase of riches and power and the extent of his rule. He has called on all the rulers and the leaders of that known realm that he have to go in that land and worship this idol. There was great production. Musical instruments will be playing in unison. Musical instruments from Persia, Assyria, Judah, Greece, and India. The activity is designed to affect the senses, to intimidate, to put one in awe, to move the emotions, and probably to enter the mind, to, to empty the mind. And probably as the activity is going on, the ambience is like heaven came down on earth, and Nebuchadnezzar himself is a powerful figure. So in short, the activity is designed altogether to magnify and exalt Nebuchadnezzar. Such is done with great imagination, great production, the greatness of human activity, musicality, artistry, the world, worldly wisdom, worldly power in showcase. But for a faithful Jew, such activity is an open and direct contempt of God. We would read the Ten Commandments. The first two commandments has set, told us this, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 and 5. Verse 1, God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the hands of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is, in, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generation of those who hated me. Now, how can we explain this? Let me open to you the Westminster Larger Catechism, question number 109. What sins are forbidden in the second commandment? And this is the answer. The sins forbidden in the second commanded, commandment are all devising, counseling, commanding, using, and anywise approving any religious worship not instituted by God Himself. The making any representation of God of all, of all or of any of the three persons either inwardly in our mind or outwardly in any kind of image or likeness of any creature whatsoever, all worshipping of it or God in it or by it, the making of any representation of feigned deities and the worship of them or service belonging to them, all superstitious devices, corrupting the worship of God, adding to it or taking from it, whether invented and taken up for ourselves or received by traditions from others, though under the title of antiquity, custom, devotion, good intent, or any other pretense whatsoever, simony, sacri sacrilege, all neglect, contempt, hindering and opposing the worship and ordinances which God had appointed. And here we would see that we are not exempt from the sins that are laid out for us. We are all guilty. God is saying here that God alone is worthy and deserving of worship. But secondly, God has the sole authority to command all men and order how worship should be conducted. And man should obey any form of worship that is not sanctioned by God is an abomination in the sight of God. It is the product of the imagination of sinful man. It shows to us here to worship the product of our own creation is to fall to our own deception. When we worship the product of our imagination, we deceive ourselves. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 7.31, And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the sons of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my mind. That is, Je And you will also read the same, Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 4, and following. And in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ said Himself, Mark 7, 6-8, And He said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching us doctrines, the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. This is man. Deceived by his sin. You see, in one of the lectures that were given, what was given by Pastor Espinosa in GMA, this is what he said. Worship is rejected on the grounds of doing something not commanded, not merely for doing the forbidden. And you see, when we come to worship, we should tread carefully. We are coming before the most holy God.
So here, we must be wary of our tendency to adulterate worship with the product of our fallen imagination. Any attempt to add or to subtract from God's explicit command in worship exposes the tendency of man to honor himself. This is what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Why did he build that image? Why did he call on all the rulers of his kingdom? It is to show his greatness. It is to show his majesty. It is a boast of a man that came from the ground and to dust he shall return. And should you worship that man? Any form of idolatry is a product of a depraved mind. You think of the Roman Catholic worship. Anything that we add or remove in worship is a product of our depraved mind. We do not add dances. We do not add dramatic performances. We do not need productions. What we need is God. His presence with us. We do not try to invent things in worship. We do not try to control the atmosphere in worship. We do not try to move the emotions in worship. What we desire in worship is to please God, to commune with Him, to glorify Him. You know, in December 537 CE, Justinian inaugurated the rehabilitated building which is called the Hagia Sophia or the Holy Wisdom that is now situa situated in Turkey after becoming a church for the Greek building for the Greek Orthodox Church. It, it, is, it became a mosque because the Muslim Turks invaded that land. But now it is actually a museum. It was the grandest building in Christendom at that time. In fact, someone has even said that when you enter that building, it was like heaven on earth. When that building was finished, it was heard that Justinian muttered, Solomon, I have surpassed thee. In pride, he has erected this building, not for the glory of God, but for his honor. You see, the Old Testament temple compared to other buildings even in the ancient world is vastly inferior. Maybe inferior in size, maybe inferior in articles. But the acceptance of the structure is based on the commands of God because it is the place where he chose to dwell with his people. You see the point. While in Reformed worship today, when people probably think of, look at us, or churches probably look at us, they probably may see our worship inferior. We have no drums, we have no productions, we have no large choirs. We are inferior because of our simplicity. Probably we are inferior because of our strict forwardness. But what we seek is not creativity. What we seek is obedience. To be obedient with God's word. We should not fall on the deception that is created by our own imagination. Secondly, we would see that worship is an institution from divine revelation. Here we would see in chapter 3, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were reported as violators of the king's command to worship. Now, if you would notice in chapter 3, Daniel did not relate, narrate how the tree defied the order, but that it was reported. And it was reported out of envy. It was reported maliciously. Probably, well, we could not be dogmatic about it. Probably that was the reason why Daniel's name was not here. 
because he was favored by the king. And probably think, people are thinking if we include Daniel, we would probably be in trouble because he is the governor of Babylon. So we just have to put these three. We just have to report these three. But think of this. Imagine that you are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is a time of great difficulty. This is a time of astonishment, sadness, temptation. Probably they were in the grounds, seeking, seeing the rulers of the people. And there are many other people. And they see the production ongoing. And they see the atmosphere. And then the music sounded. And everyone bowed down. And as they bowed down, they see themselves to be standing up. And they see their fellow Jews bowing down, people whom they know. Why are they bowing down? Are they not worshippers of Yahweh? Probably someone whom they know. Probably a brother, a friend, an aunt, an uncle. And they were bowing down. And they were the ones who are standing up. And they know that when they were reported, they knew that they are facing impending death. They knew that the, that the punishment for the crime was the burning fiery furnace. In verse 12, we would read of their crime. It says here, There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, Pay no attention to you. They do not honor you. They do not serve the gods that you have created. They do not worship the golden image that you have set up. And so what did the king do? To show an equivocal obedience, he gave a threat. Is it true? Verse 14, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up. How much puff up is this king looking at his glory and honor, his power? He's insulted, he's offended. Now, if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, harp, bob pipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? I am powerful. I am greater than all the gods. Who is that God that you are presenting? I am King Nebuchadnezzar. I can throw you to the burning, fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar claimed superiority against any god, even to Yahweh himself. But here we find three people answering the king. Verse 16, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace and He will deliver us out of your hands, O King. But if not, be it known to you, O King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. You see, the first part of the answer, what they're saying is this, we do not need to respond. We do not need to make a defense. We do not need to make an answer. If you have threatened us, if you think that you are greater than any God, then you can do what you wish to do. And in verse 17, literally, here it is translated in the, new, uh, in the ESV, if this be so. But literally, the word should be translated, if God is able. Now, that confuses us. But here, what it means is this. They are not questioning the ability of God. What it means is this. The answer is, 
if this be in conformity with his wise and good plan, if this is his purpose, if this will glorify God, if this is God's will for his glory, he will save us because he is able. And here, these three men have showed something distinct in the worship of Yahweh. Distinct from the unknown God. What is that? That Yahweh Himself has revealed Himself. He is a self-revealing God. He has given Him, He has given them His Word, His Torah, His Bible, the words of the prophet, the words of the Psalms. And these are people who know their God. And because of knowledge, they were able to manifest deep conviction, deep confidence, and humble submission to God. In short, they know their God. They know Yahweh as the God of power. They know Yahweh as the sovereign Lord. He is almighty. He is all-powerful. He is the all-knowing God. But not only that, they know that Yahweh will not simply move because they are concerned for their safety. But because the primary concern of Yahweh is for His glory. The true worshippers of God are those who know God. Are you a true worshipper of God? Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 4, Let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ can say this. John 4 verse 22, when he was conversing, with the Samaritan woman, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Do you know your God? Do you know your God so well that you will fall down now and worship Him? You see, the product of false, uh, false worship is always a product of ignorance. Ignorance of God. Paul has laid this out down in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. They're the people who suppress the truth. Verse 21, they're futile, futile mind. They were futile in their thinking. Verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. False worshippers are ignorant of God. And so the point that is being laid out to us here, to worship is man's response to God's self-revelation. The knowledge of the true and living God. Are you a worshipper of God? Can you say that you understand God? Can you say that you know God? Man can only rightly worship God according to the knowledge that he has from God's revelation of himself. We know from his word, he is the creator, he is the savior. Do you understand his perfections? Do you understand his attributes? Do you understand his work of redemption? Do you understand his work of providence? Do you fall down and worship? Knowing all these things. You see, many people today call themselves Christians. But they do not truly know God. What is the evidence? Where are they in time of worship? Are they worshiping God? Probably some are in their malls. Probably some are with their families. Probably some are in their beds. It shows to us that they are ignorant of God. They, truly, they do not truly know God. And so, we must hold with full conviction 
that the Word of God is the sole authority and the core centrality of acceptable worship. Because it is in the Word of God that God reveals Himself to us. It is our sole authority. It is only what the Lord, what the Word of the Lord has commanded us. Nothing should be added. Nothing should be subtracted. We should not worship any other God. And it is also central in our worship. It is the reason why we always plead to you that before you come in worship, you should be prepared to hear the word of God preach. Why? Because we have nothing to say but the glory of God. And that is everything in worship. God is the only one that should be glorified. Worship, friends and brethren, is only as meaningful as, that, as the depth of our knowledge and relationship to God. Can you be like the psalmist? Say, come, let us go. Worship God. I should rather be a doorkeeper in the temple of God. I should rather be with the people of God and worship Him. Because this is the God that I worship. This is the God that I glorify. This is the God who has revealed Himself to me. Now, do we understand now why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego can say, If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, the God whom we serve. And He will deliver us out of your hands, O King. But if not, if it is not according to His purpose, if it is not according to His glory, if it is not according to His will, be it known to you, O King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We will only worship Yahweh. You see, as Reformed, we give high regard to Calvin. John Calvin, the Reformer. Many of those who call themselves Reformed today think that the bulk of Calvin's labor on Reformation is in the issue of election. That is way, way later. And that's, that's not involving Calvin, although he has written much about election, but much of the labor of Calvin in Reformation is the issue of divine worship. Coming out from the Roman Catholic Church, he saw the deceitfulness of worship back then, probably in pain with the glory of, for the glory of God, he has reformed Geneva and he has written many things about worship. And one of the tracts that he has written is this, on the necessity of reforming the church. This is what he said. There is nothing more perilous to our salvation than a preposterous and perverse worship of God. You see, Calvin is telling us here, the issue of worship is actually the issue of salvation. If you worship falsely, that your salvation is in question. Calvin said, Let us know and be fully persuaded that wherever the faithful who worship Him purely and in due form 
according to the appoint, appointment of His Word, are assembled together to engage in the solemn acts of religious worship, He, God, is graciously present and presides in the midst of them. Do we desire that God will be with us in worship? Then we have to worship God according to His self-revelation, according to His commandment. And we must submit to God that this is His will. Our assurance that God accepts our worship is rooted on the conviction that God's Word is central. It is central in the church. For you, dear friends, many of you come here and worship with us. And you think that you are worshiping God. And you think that you are doing service for Him. Let me tell you this. A God who tolerates your sin is an idolatrous imagination. It is an idol. It is not the true and living God. Once you are exposed, once you know, once you understand, once you have the true knowledge of God, it will bring you to repentance. It would show you that the God you know is not no God at all. It would show you that this is the true God. All the gods that I have in my mind are false, are fake, are imagination. And now I am face to face with the glory and holiness and the righteousness of the judge of heaven and earth. And it will call me to repent. To repent from my sin, to change my mind about God, to change my mind about sin, to change my mind about myself. And now I have to fall on the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and beg Him, save me. Save me. I desire to worship God, but I cannot come to Him because of my sin. Save me, cleanse me, make me clean. Wash me that I may be clean. Bind me, that I may be whole, that I may come to God and worship Him. This should be your call, dear friend. This should be your call, dear sinner. Come to God. Go to Christ. Believe in Him. Fall down on Him. Beg Him. Lord, do not pass me by. Do not pass me by. In conclusion, as a Reformed Church, our motivation for missions and reformation should be the true worship of God. We desire this fallen world to fall on their knees and worship God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Our Lord and our God, Indeed, we are exposed to you and you see our hearts, you see our minds, you know our sin. We cannot hide them from you, O Lord, because we are naked as naked could ever be. Lord, you know the idols that we have set up in our hearts. You know how we have perverted our minds. And yet, O Lord, we do thank you that you have showed us your grace that you have called us to your Son, that you have saved us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we know that even as a church, even as Christians and believers, as we have called ourselves, there are times when we have not worshipped you according to what is due unto you. Help us, O Lord, because we know that we are wicked even now in our hearts. May your grace be with us, O Lord, and cleanse us from our sin. Help us to be pure and accept our worship. Save us, O Lord, from our sin. And we also cry out for our friends who are still away from the Lord Jesus Christ, 
that you would thunder on them and speak to their hearts that they may know that they are sinners before you and that they may fly to the Lord Jesus Christ as their own Lord and Savior. We ask these things in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.